Um, I think a few more people might trickle in, but I, uh, I'll go ahead and start. Um, welcome everybody to the Center for Science, Technology, Medicine, and Society. I'm Sam Evans, I'm the Associate Director for Research, and it's my great honor today to be able to introduce Professor Steve Wolgar, who is the Professor of Marketing and the Director of the Science Technology Studies Program at uh, the University of Oxford. Uh, I've known Steve for 12 years now. Wow, that's fun. Um, and we've, um, I took his STS courses. He was my first introduction to STS, actually. Um, so I'm very grateful to him for getting me into the, uh, into the groove. He has areas of expertise within the field of STS that include governance and accountability relations, mundane objects, and ordinary technologies, provocation and intervention, the visual visualization and evidence topics, social theory, and the use of neuroscience in business and in management. Uh, you may know him by his many books. He was author with Bruno Latour of Laboratory Life. He was, um, or is, I guess, books should always be spoken of in the current, in the present tense. His most recent book is on mundane governance, ontology and accountability with Daniel Nayland. Uh, he has also authored Machine at Work, Technology, Work, and Organization with Keith Grint, and a book called Science, the Very Idea, which was very influential in um, the late 80s STS debates. When I um, was at Oxford with Steve, he was uh, directing the Virtual Society program that examined a wide range of social impacts on new electronic technologies. He's also had a lot of work outside of the university as senior advisor to numerous international organizations and research councils. And in 2008, he was awarded the J.D. Burnell Prize, which is the highest honor uh, that the Society for the Social Studies of Science awards for a distinguished um, contribution to STS. His current work focuses on areas of mundane governance, neuromarketing, and web-based rating and ranking schemes. But he also has a project here which is a project that I've always actually, whenever anybody asks me, well, so what is Steve Wolgar like? I, I usually come back and, to them and say, well, if you give him a statement, he will say, but it could be otherwise. And then he'll go about unpacking that. And that is, um, to me, the essence of a Wolgarian analysis. So I'm glad to see that he's uh, presenting this as a primary focus for his work. And the way that he would describe it, I think, if you're the person who wrote the bio on your STF, on your um, Said Business School page, would be a profound, profound resistance to stabilize anything. So with that, I give it over to Steve Wolgar. for the connected folks. Uh, thanks very much, Sam, and um, uh, thanks for the invitation. It's really nice to uh, be here and uh, to be able to um, try out some ideas on, on this uh, impressive, uh, impressive group. Um, yeah, that's right, and, and thanks for just wonderful build-up. I, I, <laughs> I suppose Bulgarian is better than Bulgarist, or, or uh, anyway. Yeah, all right. Um, yes, so this is... Um, uh, uh, a book-length project I'm working on uh, this year, uh, it could be otherwise, and in a, in a way it's trying to um, get out of my system, no that's probably not the right, but really explore uh, some of the ramifications of uh, provocation. And, um, uh, and, and what I want to do in this talk is to um, look at some different um, dimensions of this. So um, I'm going to, the talk's organised in terms of talking about, well, the, the things in the subtitle really. So um, provocation, irony, limits, and I'm going to uh, talk about the idea of the, the limits of provocation uh, and of irony in, in relation to um, the way in which 9-11 um, was reported and continues to be, uh, to be reported. So let's start with um, provocation. As I said, um, I'm taking the time this year to um, uh, uh, develop a book-length project which is organised around this slogan. And the slogan is, 
It Could Be Otherwise, or ICBO, all good slogans have an acronym, and this one is no exception. And um, ICBO, you can think of as a kind of mantra, as a kind of thing you can say when things get tough, when you're in a difficult situation, when obstacles seem insurmountable, when you run up against barriers which are obdurate, uh, people who prevent you doing things, resistance is stubborn, bureaucrats are immovable, things to be seem to be just the way they are. Here's your slogan. It could be otherwise. And the, 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 and the thing is, how far can you work with that slogan? How far can you push it? Um, how far can you uh, make it uh, uh, work in your, to, to, your, to your purposes? So it's a pragmatic slogan for provoking, for challenging deeply held assumptions, for a kind of relentless questioning, and for aiding dangerous thinking. Um, I sometimes like to think of this exercise as addressing the very old question, what does it take to change someone's mind? Recognising, of course, that mind is a, a massively uh, misleading metaphor for a whole series of conventionalised and institutionalised uh, practices in which somebody is engaged. What are the implications and the consequences of this form of provocation of a kind of radical rethinking um, in the social sciences? So this raises some very interesting questions quite quickly. It raises questions like, um, well, um, why have I gone that way? Sorry. How far can you go? No, this is not right. How far can you go? What are the limits on provocation? What, if any, are the constraints on thinking differently? And in particular, uh, one of the reasons I'm, I'm most fascinated with STS is how and why do different versions of this provocation come to prominence and then die away? And I'll, I'll talk about the way my, so my version of a history of the STS, which shows how that happens. Um, what accounts, if you like, for the attenuation of provocation and dangerous ideas? One of my, one of my most favourite um, social scientists, a um, man called Mel Polner, who uh, worked in ethnomethodology, um, wrote about his disappointment with what happened to ethnomethodology. He viewed ethnomethodology as a major force of upheaval, of turning things upside down within the social sciences. And, and it espoused in its early version in the version that Garfinkel initially came out with, a form of radical reflexivity. And Mel Polner's way of uh, expressing his disappointment was to say, the thing that's happened to radical reflexivity is it seems now to have grown up, settled down, and moved out to the suburbs. And uh, writing in LA, this is a particularly a telling metaphor, I understand. Right, so, uh, really disappointing. And when he heard that I was working in a business school, uh, Mel said, ah, it's grown up, settled down, moved out to the suburbs, and now it's got its MBA <laughs> as well. Terribly disappointing. So I wanted to look at how, uh, get a different take on how otherwising works in practice. And um, uh, in, in the book I've planned, I'm working on, I want to try and work this through in, in, in relation to some particularly um, uh, grandiose um, um, ideas, like ideas of duality, scale, the idea of revelation, limits, and impact. And today's talk is going to be um, uh, tell you a little bit about what I'm thinking in terms of how it could be otherwise applies to the issue um, of um, impact. So, what are the rudiments of it could be otherwise? How is it could be otherwise? How does it work? Well, isn't, uh, nobody needs to be told in this room that um, STS is a, uh, a multidiscipline which pervades various forms of analytic scepticism. Um, and what I like best about STS, the most interesting uh, parts of STS for me, are those which take on really heady topics and weighty issues. So they address um, uh, beloved concepts like knowledge, objectivity, natural order, experiment, measurement, in, in such a way as to de uh, disarm and deflate intellectual pretense. So it's a sort of bringing down to earth of our, uh, uh, our temptation to revere these kinds of concepts. So the idea is you recast these weighty topics and these synoptic, um, these, 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 these synoptic phenomena as everyday mundane practices. 
you convert the revered and standardised ideas and concepts into objects of study. So mathematics turns into mere number work. It's work with chalk, it's work on a board, uh, it, it's mundane practice which makes up the grand idea. And you can approach this in schematic terms in a couple of different ways. One is you can make those, turn those grand ideas into uh, things of process. You, you say that they are processual, you say they are situated, you say they are contingent, and a handy way to do that is by what I call gerundizing them. So you add ing to the, to the, to the concept. All right, so um, rather than be in, paralyzed by this um, revered and much, um, much talked about topic ethics, let us instead construe our topic as ethicizing. That is, look, look at the process and practice of the work of doing and claiming, constructing and foisting ethics. Uh, in, in terms of the future, let us instead talk about future ring, draw attention to the processes and practices whereby futures are built and delivered and sustained and so on. Uh, the same with governance, um, you add ING, this is not about what governance is, it's about how people make stuff into governance. It's the governancing work which is really important to look at. And this, this kind of little formula works quite well with most things until you get to stuff like marketing and then it's, then it's a bit tricky because it would, of course, be marketing ting. And <laughs> uh, nobody's going to publish that. Um, or, different tactic to achieve the same sort of end, you make these apparently robust concepts into the objects of sceptical ethnographic inquiry. And to do that, instead of en uh, adding ING, you add O-G-R-A-P-H-Y. You turn it into anography. So technology becomes technography. It becomes the anthropologically inclined sceptical study of what counts as technology in the situation. Epistemology becomes epistemography. It is a study of the practices whereby people render what they're doing as being about this thing called epistemology. Uh, and, and similarly with ontology, you can talk about doing an ontography. It is a relentlessly sceptical study of the ways in which some philosophers talk about and try to detect and determine what counts as an ontology. Okay, so these are the sort of basics of how to do it could be otherwise. And one applies various kinds of STS sensibilities, again, which are well known to many of you here. You need to work through these difficult concepts using specific empirical cases. This is not an abstract uh, exercise. This is a down-to-earth, in-the-field, in-your-face exercise. You do try to deflate the grandiose theoretical concepts and claims. Instead of that, you tend to emphasize the local, the specific, the contingent. And all this, as you know, was originally directed at traditional claims about truth and objectivity in science and technology. And that's where the whole spirit of, of scepticism comes from, because we used to think that science and technology was the hardest possible case. Now, it used to be a pretty good argument that if you could show that physics was a social construction, then you can show that divorce rates are a social construction, they're a pushover. Right, so you, you know, the hardest possible case, go for the, the hard line of physics and so on. Um, these days, I think the situation has changed quite a lot. The hardest possible cases are much more to do with things like ethics and accountability. And it's not that we revere, maybe SDS has done its job. It's not so much that we revere epistemology and ontology in the way that we used to. And there emerged a whole series of ethnographic perspectives on scientific work and technology development in practice. And in all these studies, throughout, the sensibility of STS asked us to attempt to maintain impartiality and symmetry with respect to what is being taken for granted. All of this you will know. So, in, in teaching uh, a course, a graduate course in this area, um, I found myself organising it on historical principles and, you know, I know at least, at least Nadia and, and Sam have suffered this very course, so they know what I'm talking about. Um, and one would start with Merton, then Kuhn, Strong Programme, Constructivism, AMT, Reflect... I mean, you know, stop me if you've heard it, right? But what's so interesting that I discovered was that this can be organised in terms of a shifting provocation, a shifting uh, provocation in terms of the symmetries which are involved. So if we start with Merton, 
Merton, the sociologist of science, um, what he brought into the, into the field, uh, and it was a breakthrough in its time, was the idea that science could be considered as a social institution along with all the other social institutions. Religion, the family, education and so on. He said there's no reason why science should be excluded from that. In other words, he's forcing a symmetry between science and those other social institutions. If you move to uh, uh, a writer like Kuhn, of course he's famous for saying, or probably saying, but later disclaiming that he ever said, that paradigms are equivalent to each other. He's forcing, if you like, a symmetry between one paradigm and its successor paradigm. That there's no independent, transcendental, ontological basis for discriminating between paradigms. Pushing a symmetry. The strong programme, the guys at Edinburgh, Bloor and Barnes and so on, they offered a symmetry in a slightly different way. A symmetry between truth and falsity. They argued that it was really important to study claims which are regarded as true and the claims which are regarded as false in exactly the same way. Something which had not been done uh, in many uh, sociological circles before then. Constructivism wanted to argue that it was social factors as well as technical factors that had to be taken into account. It wasn't just technical determinism um, which made technologies work. A symmetry between the social and the technical. Actor network theory is most famous for um, of course, pressing the symmetry between uh, uh, humans and non-humans. Uh, and um, then reflexivity, a lot of reflexive writing around the period uh, that actor network theory was just getting going, uh, was pushing a symmetry between the observer and the observed and saying, basically, we cannot pretend that there is a distinct, distinct, distinct difference between the observer and the observed in terms of our uh, analytic schemes and so on. And moving right on into things like relational ontologies, ambivalence, fluidity, multiplicity, deferral, which um, you know, I think still currently are trying to work out a whole series of uh, proposed um, symmetries. So you've got a whole series of successive um, symmetries which go like that. Now, you can also say, make the same chart work for, um, if you think about um, different uh, provocations on essentialism. For each of those symmetries, uh, in each case, uh, the, the school involved is trying to press home uh, or trying to provoke what we thought, what we taken for granted in terms of what was essential and what could not be thought of as essential. So I'm just running the same, exactly the same slide as it were, um, like that. Now, so this is all very exciting stuff, and, and what, I, what I love about STS is that in each of these incarnations it, 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 it causes trouble, right? So it can, it can upset people, it can, it can provoke, um, it, it can cause trouble. Um, but, um, sorry to say, uh, it's also possible to identify uh, quite a lot of backsliding. Um, so, <laughs> so the people who are the most um, angry young men uh, uh, do settle down and move out to the suburbs and you tend to get um, versions of, for example, actor network theory, which um, pay very little attention to the ontological flattening, which is the provo provocative part of it, and instead move to a more routine analysis of describing what actually the inherent characteristics of different nodes in the network, network are. So, you know, in that particular case, for example, you move from um, anti-essentialism to a kind of distributed essentialism. Um, in actor network theory, it's lots of different nodes, and those different nodes are themselves presumed or treated as um, I I I essential. Okay, so just wondering about how that works, um, it, it seems to me to get uh, very interesting and think about, well, uh, uh, and bring, bring that together with another, another set of interests that I have, is in the ways of being provocative, in particular an interest that I've had um, in irony, and whether or not irony is a helpful way of being provocative or not. So I'm now going to talk a little bit about an irony. And nothing better than to start with some examples. Um, irony um, um, is widely said to be one of those things which uh, is really difficult to define, but you know it when you see it. Um, and uh, here's some examples of it. Um, this is, this is um, well, you can see what it is. I mean, why do I tell you what it is? You know, <laughs> <laughs> 
and uh, in in a way, the uh, the text is not mine. The 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 um, the, the uh, text there that get, went came with the photograph uh, as an attempt to explain what is what is what irony is. And basically, what you see going on there is, of course, that the stop sign is itself being ironicised with an additional. Um, text there, which makes it into the thing you should stop is to stop defacing stop signs. And um, I think w one of the things that's interesting about that is that there's just a possibility that somebody would look at that and not get it and not see that it's ironic. That somebody would say, oh, okay, so uh, this is asking us not to, not to deface stop signs. Right? And that, I think, is, what is absolutely central to the joy of irony, the possibility that some people will not get it and they get it straight. Uh, slightly um, more elaborate uh, example. This is at the post office counter, and it's um, late Saturday morning, and post offices, as we know in this state, close at 12.30, I think, don't they? Yeah. Anyway, so you're edging, you're edging up endlessly, you wait for hours, to get to the, the front of the line, and you edge forward at a snail's pace, and there's only one clerk at the, at the front, and um, eventually one of the customers gets to the top, and he can't contain himself anymore. He says, you fucking bastard. Have you any idea how long we've been standing in line? I've been waiting 45 minutes. Is this the best you can do? What a bunch of losers. And the clerk replies, you foul-mouthed git. It sounded a bit British, actually, didn't it? <laughs> we don't need your sort in here. You are the problem, pal. Why don't you just fuck out of, out of here? Right. And the reply is, ha, so how are you, Jeff? Ha, yeah, not so bad. Yourself, how's the kids? I mean, I think this is, you know, this is, this is one of my fav favourite examples. And again, it's got some elements in it which, we can, which I want to go into in more detail, but it's, it's got things like um, the performance of these utterances is meant to, or seems subsequently, to have keyed off the possibility that there are people, perhaps people standing in the line around, um, who will, might not get that these guys know each other and are friends, as it turns out in the later two utterances. So, to pull off the irony, you have to do some quite interesting performative work, and that's what I want to come back to. You have to perform the possibility that there are people listening who won't get it. And you have to perform the identities of the people involved. And you know what you notice in the transcript and the way that I've transcribed it is that the custom and the clerk become Ben and Jeff, right? They enact that they are customer and clerk in the first couple of utterances they enact that they are Ben and Jeff in the, in the latter kinds of utterances and so on. Okay, so some examples and perhaps we can come back to that. So, potentially then, I think irony is a particular form of provocation and I'm interested in trying to figure out um, in what way it does, it could be otherwise. I think potentially it's a means to challenge, resist and provoke and to challenge and resist and provoke assumptions underlying representation while still using language which is suffused with these assumptions. So, uh, you know, we, we, we're so sort of bound up theoretically with the, the problem of representation and what are alternatives to representation and what, what sort of experiments can you carry out to, to uh, poke fun at the um, conventions of representation and so on and so forth. And I think irony is one interesting one because it, it lives within the idiom of representation, yet it performs communities and hearers and, and it enacts uh, entities which recognise the irony of the language which it's using. So it's, it's both a critique of representation while unavoidably still deploying representational idioms. And it's the nearest I know to having one's cake uh, and eating it too. Okay. So, I sh should, should mention here that um, um, in, 
in, in, in indulging myself in, 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 in an interest in irony, um, I've had to, I ran up against a number of warnings against studying irony. So um, people have said, you really should not study irony. And um, one, uh, one piece of advice from a good uh, old friend, Donald Campbell, was that the problem with studying irony is that that takes all the joy out of it. That as soon as you tr make any attempt to codify what's going on in irony, you lose the joy because it's something ineffable which cannot be grasped and so on. Um, I had the advice from uh, Karen Noor Katina that um, irony is just, uh, just, just a waste of time because everything ends up just being irony. Um, and, uh, you know, that was, that was pretty, pretty, slightly, pretty scary, you know, everything being just irony. And Steve Shapin, who I noticed was a guest earlier in the year here, um, in his inimitable way, said that I would just end up pumping irony. So, definitions. It's something like to say one thing but mean something else. It is an expression of meaning by words normally conveying opposite meanings, apparent perversity of fate or circumstance. It is a rhetorical device, technique or event characterised by an incongruity or contrast between the expectations of a situation and what is really the case. And I find these terribly wooden. You know, they seem to be, perhaps Donald Campbell was right, you know, trying to pin down this stuff in a t terribly mechanical way. Um, we should particularly note and have our STS Atenae buzzing when any, ever, any, whenever anyone uses the phrase, what is really the case. Um, to have it included in the definition, something that depends on what is really the case. Um, if you look at um, uh, other commentaries or, or, or well-known commentaries on, um, on irony, um, Alfred North Whitehead um, is not a fan of irony. He says that irony is a depressive frame of mind. Irony signifies the state of mind of people or of an age which has lost faith. They conceal their loss or even flaunt it by laughter. You seldom get irony except from people who have been somehow more or less cleaned out. Kierkegaard takes a different view. In our age there's been much talk about the importance of doubt for science and scholarship, but what doubt is to science, irony is to personal life. Just as scientists maintain that there's not true science without doubt, so it may be maintained that no genuinely human life is possible um, without irony. And then, I guess my favourite comment, of course, um, irony eludes definition. And this elusiveness, uh, this, is a gr this is a really good definition. Irony, what is it? It eludes definition. And this elusiveness is one of the main reasons why it is a source of so much fascinated inquiry and speculation. So, what counts as irony is highly variable. And if you look at the, the, the literature in, in literary theory or in linguistics, you find that there are many, many different forms of irony, situational, dramatic, verbal, um, and, and so on. And um, in particular, in, in many kinds of social science, there's a form of situational irony um, which takes the following kind of form. You say that many people think that something is the case, whereas actually something else is the case. And that's a sort of rather instrumental situational irony. And if you can say that many people think something is the case, but actually something, something else is the case, then that gives you the license to fill out the difference. How do you explain the difference? You explain the difference by saying it's because of social factors, social class, social circumstances, um, or whatever. So the, 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 that kind of irony relies again on what actually, uh, what actually is the case. Different kinds of irony, situational, dramatic, verbal, is just three of many, many of those. Okay, and I think you can find out about what is irony um, as much by looking at debates about what is not irony. And um, Alanis Morissette has become famous uh, by being the target um, of um, uh, volumes and volumes of discussion about uh, why or why not her song, Ironic, in 1995, is not, in fact, ironic. And you will recall, you, you all know the song. Um, you're not going to make me sing it, no. <laughs> it includes the, li li the lines like, It's like rain on your wedding day. 
Isn't it ironic? It's a traffic jam when you're already late. An old man won the lottery and died the very next day. It's a black fly in your Chardonnay. Right. And, and, so, and there's many, many others like that. And um, the point about this is, is, this is these are not ironic. I am sorry, Alanis, these are not ironic. This is unfortunate. <laughs> this is tough luck, and somebody said this song should have been called Unfortunate. <laughs> Isn't it unfortunate? That would have been, would have been the refrain. And the people who've um, pointed out that this is not ironic, or argue that it's not ironic, have then, what they've done is they've supplemented um, these words and um, added words to them to explain how it could be ironic. And so this is what you get. It's like the rain on your wedding day. Yes, it's ironic if you are getting married to a weatherman who chose the date so as to ensure good weather. It's a traffic jam when you're already late. This is rather complicated. <laughs> yes, if you're a town planner on your way to a meeting of town planners where you are due to give a talk about how you've solved the traffic problem but you couldn't get to it because you were stuck in traffic. Irony, right? An old man won the lottery and died the very next day from a severe paper cut <laughs> from his lottery ticket. Yeah, that, that does it, right? Okay. <laughs> And um, this the last one's rather complicated, the commentary on this. It's a black fly in your Chardonnay, and the, I and the commentator. The irony here is that there's nothing remotely ironic about this line. A deliberate contrast, in other words, between the apparent and intended textbook meaning of irony. And so by probably sheer fluke, Alanis Morissette has been brilliantly given us an example of irony, because it's not an example of irony. Get it? It's hard, hard, hard to keep up. Okay, thus far. It seems to me that the most interesting provocative forms of irony are those which make a point. So the, the kind of irony that I like is the irony that's a way of making a point by using a joke, by saying the thing you don't mean. This kind of irony, it seems to me, is inherently subversive, it ridicules the status quo, undercuts it, questions it, and attacks it. Ironicists are troubled by sincerity. And that's a good thing. They do not take too seriously a grand version of events that people are trying to foist on you. So, you know, when so it, is, it is time for our country to go to war in Iraq. Um, so, oh, well, yeah, wh why is that? Um, it, it wasn't yesterday, and it may not be tomorrow. Tell me more about that. The ironicist is contrasting the whole time with the other version of events. So, it's more than just a contrast between expectations and what is really the case. That's what we had, well, what we had earlier. Irony is performative, as I tried to make clear with those two first examples, the sign and the interchange there. The irony enacts context, that is, in order for there to be something which is ironic, you have to perform or enact a context which is relevant to the irony in order to make it um, ironic. Uh, and that, that, and that, that's what's happening there. And more interestingly, what the irony does, it enacts at least dual audiences, maybe multiple, but probably at least dual audiences. It partitions the potential audience to the irony into those who hear it straight and those who hear it as challenging the status quo and as partitioning, partitioning the audience response. And it seems to me for the irony to be the kind of irony which I like, <laughs> uh, I didn't say real irony, uh, the kind of uh, really nice irony, um, you have to have people who might hear it straight. You know, it's a... It's a, it's a um, um, Spike Milligan, the very much loved um, uh, national treasure of, um, uh, of sceptical humour, uh, anarch anarchic humour, who died a couple of years ago, um, had on his tombstone, I told you I was ill. And what's so beautiful about that is it seems to me that there's just the possibility that you can imagine people standing in front of the tombstone and saying, oh, he was ill. I mean, for heaven, you know, and they, they don't get it. What's, you know, so it, it's a partitioning which works with the irony. 
And it, it is, of course, um, alert to its ongoing dynamic. So that complicated thing with the, um, the black fly and the Chardonnay um, ob being obviously not ironic and therefore a really great example of irony it is a very nice sense, uh, illustration of um, there's an ongoing sense of dynamism that comes with the irony. It doesn't just stop with the stand-up line, the one-liner joke. Um, it goes on uh, in, in, in interesting ways. Okay, so I'll say a bit about um, that's, that's how it works and say a bit about... Uh, not getting irony and it is widely reported and said with much glee by the people not affected that certain categories of people don't get irony right uh, Americans <laughs> Americans don't get irony it is I mean it's a terrible thing to say but um, it, 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 it is said by a lot of people right okay some people say that Americans don't get irony by contrast for example with Australians who get irony and I heard a discussion about this um, interesting national difference um, not long ago and uh, somebody explained that um, the British sent all the jolly convicts to Australia the oppressed minority for whom irony was, is, is, a great, uh, is a great mechanism for um, managing their oppression and so on um, whereas um, the British sent the Puritans to America and uh, the Puritans weren't at all keen on, uh, weren't keen on irony. Germans Germans don't get irony, it is widely said. More interestingly, those without social cognition or a theory of mind. Those for whom it's difficult to figure out what's going on in somebody else's head. What the world looks like to people other than yourselves. And um, irony often comes with um, paralinguistic markers and people who don't get irony don't notice the markers of the irony. So typical irony uh, markers are exclamation marks. Um, uh, you know, when a hurricane's blowing and you say, lovely weather we're having, exclamation mark, right? That's the, the, the marker that there might be something ironic going on in the, you know, or ha, right? Or one which is um, popular over the last few years, um, especially in the American context is nap. You know, so hurricane blowing, great weather we're having, not. Right, that's a sort of, you know, that's a sort of marker too. Interested in that in other languages there are more and less of these, these markers. So uh, evidently in, in Hebrew, davka, it works um, quite well as a marker. Um, yeah, right is uh, also a kind of linguistic marker which works too. And there's a whole series of other kinds of markers which are associated with irony. The way you stress when you... Uh, perform the irony, the, the, how you stress the sentence. Uh, nasalization is apparently recognized by linguists as a mode of uh, indicating irony is present. Uh, kinesic um, uh, uh, markers so that um, you can do inverted commas on things for irony. And morphological, which means you can, um, you can surround the statement with ideas like, uh, so we're told, or that's what it looks like, or, and, and things like that. So not getting irony is not getting is not is not getting the, the, the is the possibility of not being able to recognise those markers, and um, somewhat inevitably and rather depressingly, I discovered that of course irony has been studied as a brain function, and um, uh, I find I find this a bit depressing because, you know, what I th what I imagined I was into was the thing that it was least possible to reduce you know, to like a biological mechanism or, um, you know, it, 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 any kind of other human behaviour, okay, you can reduce it, but irony, please, you know, you can, no, irony turns out to be a function of the brain, can you imagine it? Okay, so, um, uh, neuroscientists reckon that the loss of the ability to detect irony was, is associated with some form of frontotemporal dementia. And um, there's not been a number of experiments carried out on the ability to detect sarcasm from paralinguistic cues. So this research um, would, play an would play a video to subjects and the video would, would comprise um, some, uh, a, a, a teacher giving a class, a lecturer giving a lecture, and somebody coming in 10, 15 minutes late. And the person coming in would say, sorry I'm late. And the lecturer would say, oh, 
I'm sure you couldn't avoid it. it. Must have been something really important that meant you couldn't get here on time. You, you all get the irony? Yeah, okay. Anyway, some patients who had um, this, this, this form of dementia um, couldn't, c couldn't, couldn't get it. They, they just went over their, yeah, <laughs> over their head. <laughs> um, and it turns out that they, and this is the interesting thing, and this is why I'm still going with this, um, the left hemisphere, the temporal, front temporal lobe, is associated with language and social interaction. So they expected that among the people who didn't get it, there would be some evidence of loss there. But in fact, it turns out what they discovered was, there was the loss was all in the right hemisphere, the parahippocampal gyrus, which is mostly associated with the detection of social context. So, I never thought I could use brain research in any way at all, but what this is telling us is that the brain, the evidence from, from neurological studies, is that it's the inability to detect social context which is tied up with the inability to figure out what is irony. Okay. Um, so, now I want to talk about um, the limits to irony. I mean, the thing that really interested me about this was that um, all this stuff about irony being dead um, with 9-11. With and um, uh, so, I, so I said about looking at all the sources again to, to see well, wh wh what does it mean to say irony is dead and why should somebody think that irony is dead at this point and so on. Well, the, um, the, the, there are arguments, of course, which predate 9-11. Um, which predate and uh, a book, some of you might know it, by uh, Jedediah Purdy, um, which talks about irony and commitment in the, in, in, in the United States, um, has a long... Um, argument which says that irony is irresponsible and irony gives rise to lack of commitment and we should be uh, bolder about seeking truth and so on. So, quote from, irony refuses to believe in the depth of relationships, the sincerity of motivation or the truth of speech. Um, a quote from Stephen Thompson, who, who one of the editors of The Onion. This is uh, three days after the 9-11 uh, bombings. I heard a staff member saying something chilling. The age of irony is dead. And then the most famous one from the editor of Vanity Fair, Graydon Carter, who, s who, 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 who said, um, there's going to be a seismic change. I think it's the end of the age of irony. And, and this prompted some sort of counter-arguments quite quickly on irony is dead, long live irony, from David Beers. And John Stewart on The Daily Show, um, wondered whether you know, all kinds of humour had to be stopped now. Um, does 9-11 also up mark the end of puns, he said. Um, and later on, after, this is after the Obama was elected, uh, the US has become an irony-free zone. And um, uh, writing more recently, Lear talks about the end of irony as a, as a rundown sense of a detachment and lack of commitment prevalent in the 1990s. So what you seem to be seeing here is not so much the end of irony as a whole, but a kind of, um, uh, a kind of a re grasping of a particular sense of irony as against to the kind of fashionista type of irony which was quite prevalent in the 1990s. So, limits, what are these limits then? Well, um, it's fairly safe to say that in the immediate aftermath of 9 11, there were serious doubts about the wisdom of satire and humour. And um, the Onion staffers agonised about whether or not to put out an issue, and they actually cancelled the 19th of September issue. And it's very difficult now to figure out um, whether they cancelled it because they thought humour was inappropriate, or whether they cancelled it because, well, you know, to get, a, to get a, uh, an issue out, given all the circumstances and issues about people coming in from, for work and uh, the paper delivery and all the rest of it. Um, the Daily Show went, went off air for nine days and um, Gilbert Gottfried um, was one of the first people to make a public joke about 9-11 and he was hissed at. Um, he, uh, the joke was that um, there's this thing called a roast. I mean, I didn't know what roasts were, but there's a, there's a place in New York where they have annual roasts. And does everyone know what a roast is? Yeah. Like a roast is where you, um, you, um, 
say very unpleasant things and make very bad jokes, uh, cruel jokes about a particular celebrity. On this occasion, it was Hugh Hefner, I think. That's right. And, and, and they lined up a load of comedians to say nasty things about him in a jokey way. So they have a roast. I mean, it's, it's, it's delightful for anthropologists. Uh, natives have a roast. You know. um, but anyway, um, he said that he wanted to get a direct flight there to the roast, um, but it was a flight where they said they had to stop at the Empire State Building. And there was, you know, it's reported that this is very well documented that there was um, hissing at the joke and somebody yelled out, too soon, which is very interesting, you know. And um, when The Onion did come back uh, in publication on the 26th of September, um, uh, it is quoted by uh, an article by Kazan that the Onion writers aimed their bile at the hijackers and the paper was deluged with fan mail from readers who found catharsis in the terrorist's derisive rendering. So, what The Onion did, we're going to have a look at that in a minute, what The Onion did was they um, ironicised the, the whole, um, um, the, the, the hijacking, and uh, readers, according to this account, um, enjoyed that because it was the terrorists who were being ironicised. And uh, I think that's quite um, interesting to contrast with what actually happened there. Um, these are some of the headlines in the 26th of September uh, of The Onion. I want to read out some of them for you. Okay, I can't immediately find it. Hijackers surprised to find themselves in hell. And um, had an interview with one of the hijackers who said that he was promised a land of milk and honey and, and, and 50 virgins. And here he was, he, he was in hell. And that was a rum deal because it, they, they'd broken the promise that if he attacked America, um, he, he would be fine and so on. Generation X irony cynicism may be permanently um, obsolete. I've got to find some of these. I'm sorry, they're too good to miss. Remember, oh, they interviewed somebody called Dave Holt, 29, who often appears in the Onion. Uh, remember the day after the attack when all the senators were singing God Bless America arm in arm? Well, normally I'd make some sarcastic wisecrack about something like that, but this time I was deeply moved. This earnestness can't last forever, can it? Um, or again, in the same issue, President urges calm and restraint among um, uh, ballad singers, um, reporting that the President had urged Mariah Carey and Michael Jackson and other sing singers to resist the urge to record mawkish, insipid, all-star tribute ballads, because, please, there has already been enough suffering. US urges Bin Laden to form a nation it can attack. Um, Area Man uses um, the attacks as an excuse to call um, ex-girlfriend. Ex and dildo manufacturers uh, say nation must return to normalcy uh, and, and purchase, purchase dildos. In the following, uh, in the following uh, issue, they had carried the headline, Shattered Nation Longs to Care About Stupid Bullshit Again. And the caption against the Lopez picture was, Jennifer Lopez, about whom the nation gave a shit in, early, in happier times, which I thought was rather nice. In uh, the UK, the Private Eye came out with its first post-9-11 issue. It reported in its editorial that this was actually, this was an attack on everything that we in the civilised world hold dear, mainly our money. And that was terrible. They reported that the Reverend Jerry Falwell, the, the Southern um, Baptist minister, uh, had, uh, was, was blaming lesbians um, for it. Uh, because um, God had held a uh, God had held up a shield which protected America um, against exactly this kind of thing, but the trouble with the gay people, the homosexuals, and the lesbians was that their behaviour had encouraged God to remove the shield, and so they were to blame for the for the 9/11 attacks. Um, Private Eye was very keen on 
juxtaposing um, uh, the media contributions in this, in this, in this time right after 9-11. And there's two, two quotes from Kay Burley of Sky News here. One, if you just joined us, the entire eastern seaboard of the United States has been decimated in a terrorist attack. And then a little bit later, people comment on how in control I am, but my emotions don't matter. When I'm telling the news, all that's important are the facts. And um, media hypocrisy, again, with the Guardian newspaper. The period since the tragedy has been characterised as a retreat from banality. Editors and broadcasters have rightly judged that their audiences are in no mood for the niblets of trivia which used to form their staple diet. And the, the page before that, the headline reads, To Die For. What made Nigella Lawson decide to go blonde? Right. So they're very good at, 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 um, uh, at, at, at listing the things. Uh, Private Eye came across a list of inappropriate songs which was sent out uh, by Clear Channel to its 1100 American radio stations. Songs which should not be played um, in the immediate aftermath of the attack on the World Trade Center. They include Bits and Pieces by the Dave Clark Five, In the Air Tonight by Phil Collins, The World Without Love by Peter and Gordon, Morning Has Broken by Cat Stevens, He Ain't Heavy, He's My Brother by The Hollies, Imagine by John Lennon, Stairway to Heaven by Led Zeppelin, and about 20, 20, or, 30, uh, 20 or 30 more of those things. And the front cover ran with this. Bush takes charge, and at the moment of revelation when the aide whispers in the ear of, of George Bush and says, it's Armageddon, sir, uh, Bush replies, Armageddon out of here. And uh, it's, uh, it's also a play on your... Uh, previous president's uh, inability uh, with the uh, English language uh, uh, as well. The paper included um, uh, uh, an offer of your own free three minute silence, and you were, uh, readers are invited to join in the above silence as a mark of respect for the 328 special tragedy supplements that we have been forced to publish um, this week. The paper also included a special cut out and keep subscription cancellation form. So, dear sir, I was shocked and appalled. I was shocked and appalled by the cover stroke cartoon stroke article stroke crossword delete as applicable in the latest issue of Private Eye. I have been a reader for d -d 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 years and have never been so offended. Please cancel my subscription at once. And um, in, actually, in the next issue, a uh, Mr. Oh, Bin Laden sent in a cancellation form, uh, which the editor said may not be probably not genuine. In the next issue, what's extraordinary in the next issue was that the polarisation of views about the ironies which Private Eye was perpetrating. So, on the one hand, a whole a l large number, I uh, think about sort of 12 uh, anti comments. So. While I admire Private Eye for many things, you really should take your heads out of your Oxbridge asses occasionally and realise that there are simply some occasions when you should resist taking the piss. Six and a half thousand dead in a terrorist atrocity is one of them. And sorry, but this time you missed it badly. The Armageddon issue was tortured and highly offensive to many. I lost friends in WTC. There's no funny joke that can be made about some old lady hit by a bus at high speed, and certainly no joke when a couple leap from floor 102 to their death, hand in hand, rather than be consumed in flames. I regret to say I didn't find number 1037 funny. In fact, under the awful circumstances, I found it to be nauseating. Equally, a much larger number of letters praising Private Eye. Thank you, thank you, thank you for talking common sense being rational and exposing the wire coverage of the terrorist attacks by television and papers. Your approach has been far more sensitive than that of any other media organisations. Keep up the good work. Congratulations on your current issue. Very frank, funny and refreshing after 10 days of Armageddon newsprint. Well done. Thank you for keeping your nerve over the awful business in New York. You do realise, of course, that you will henceforth be considered to be terrorists under Uncle Sam's new If You Ain't For Us, You're Against Us policy. Congratulations, the eye is a much needed voice of sanity uh, in such times. And these letters went on for, the pros and the antis went on for a few weeks until the editor 
called a halt to it, and he called a halt to it um, saying that the pro-letters in the end had outnumbered the antis by about, uh, by about 100 to 1. Okay, so I think what I've tried to do here is to give you a sense of how, uh, what kinds of irony might be associated with um, provocation. And um, I just want to conclude by saying that in the context of this inquiry into it could be otherwise, um, it's very important to look at the operation consequences and fate of provocation. And I've been looking today or trying to think about irony as a mode of provocation. Certainly, it comes in many varieties and degrees. And crucially, I think, it's a form of otherwising, it's a form of provocation which involves audience and community performance and partition. And it seems, in retrospect, that calls for the end of irony, uh, what's sometimes called the end of the American holiday from history, uh, refer to a debased version of, of irony. Uh, one of my uh, fun to read um, favourite uh, philosophers, uh, Slavoj Zizek, um, says, now is the time to resist the simple choice of taking sides. Uh, we mustn't be forced into an us versus them, uh, which I think, you know, lifts my heart because I think, is, is, do you, are, are we saying Zizek is about to become ironic? No, he says the real choices are hidden. And then he exposes what the, the real choices are. And the real choices are um, the, the, the capitalist America, which supports the terrorists, um, or non-capitalist America, anti-capitalist, in, in his view, and so on. That's all I'm going to say. Um, I have some things to say about 9-11 conspiracy theories, if people want to talk about that in the questions. But thank you for that. <laughs>